Lots of people are having trouble having happiness, having joy, being satisfied in life. And James is a great book to look at and see what we should be doing. And as you can see, hey, there's testing coming, isn't there? There's testing coming to every one of us. Our faith will be put to the test every time. So we need to make sure that we know and understand what God is going to do for us. So, in James chapter 1, it says, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. <clears throat> you know, we have trouble counting things as joy when we go through struggles. And I was just, as I was putting this together, I was thinking about what I went through and what it's taken to get me to this point today. And it's a scary thought to think about all that junk. It honestly is. The trials and tribulations, the devil has tried to kill me since I was born. Um, when I was just an infant, he tried to destroy me, and uh, I would, never made it out of the hospital, I had to stay, and uh, he tried to kill me then, when I was a young boy of about five or six, I had a hammer stuck in my head, and uh, the neighbor lady thought I was dying, blood running everywhere. The devil has tried to do away with me so many countless times and destroy my life because he saw God's plan and he didn't like that. But what all have you been through? What tests have you been through? What kind of diverse temptations have you seen that you're being tested with and you ain't real happy with it. But this says that we should count it all joy because the faith, uh, the trying of our faith works patience in us. And I always tell everybody, don't pray for patience because guess what? You're going to get trials if you pray for that. But actually you're going to get it anyway, so you might as well pray for it and get it over with, right? Right? Because if we have a different outlook on what the trials are and what they're doing to us, we'll have a different outlook on what the ending is actually going to be like. When I found out that I had cancer, You know, you, you question why, what's this for, why do I have to go through this trial? It didn't seem fair, but you know what? Life ain't fair. And then God spoke to me and said, I need you to go here though. Okay, so heard me travel back and forth to Chicago week after week after week, go through all this stuff. But the lives that we crossed up there and were touched. And even after that, I had people call me and talk to me. The lives that got touched. Then I understood why I went through it. I didn't like it. I mean, nothing about it is pleasant. But the lives that got touched and changed, including my own, 
because it afforded me a different look at the things of life. Because life is is very a precious thing. But in the same essence, it doesn't matter because I'm already dead. And I forget that part of it, that I've already been dead, I'm already buried with Christ, I'm already risen, a new creature, and I've just got to hang on to this stuff until Jesus comes back. And I should count it all joy. And I should look at it in a different outlook of life. But that's why there's so much depression in this world. is because it's all the woe is me mentality. Oh, God must hate me. Look at all He's put me through. No, He loves you. He'd like you to be more like Him. And, you know, it's going to take a little something because you're all hard-headed and it takes something to get people turned around. And I, I thought if there's no adversity in our lives, if there was no trials, where would you be? Every one of you would be sitting in a bar this morning drinking. You'd be smoking, you'd be doing dope, you'd be feeling great, and you wouldn't think about anything else because your flesh would consume you and eat you alive and you'd do what it wants and that's what your flesh would like to do, destroy you. And we would do it no matter what. So if we're looking at what he's trying to do for us, he says, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So many people are looking for something to fill the hole in their life. They think it's material things, but it's not. It's having peace and patience in our lives through Christ Jesus. It's not anything else. Because he says in verse 5, if you lack any wisdom, well, what is wisdom? The ability to know how to do something with the information. Because you can be the smartest person in the world and you don't know how to put it down on paper, guess what? It means nothing. If you can't relate that to someone and get it across to someone, you're of no benefit to mankind. So we have to be able to do that. So if anyone lacks wisdom, letting asked of God that gives to all men liberally and unbraideth not, and it shall be given to them. You know, we, uh, we look at things and we say, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that challenge. Now, I've been put up against that so many times. Back when I was a nice, prideful person, I was educated, knowledgeable, had all kinds of abilities. Talked to a place about a job, and they said, we'd love to hire you. You're the most qualified. you the only one that passed the test, but we're not going to hire you. And I'm going, huh, what, what? Well, we're going to hire these women from Pepsi that can't do anything because we've got to balance out our uh, numbers. Would you like a job later on down the road when numbers balance out? I said, no, I'll pass. My pride got in the way. Otherwise, I would have probably been there. But that was not what God wanted me. He wanted me to get over my pride. He wanted me to step out and have that, what he wanted me to have, not what I wanted. But he says and tells us, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. And how many times have people said, well, you know, I, I prayed and I didn't get it, so I just quit praying. You know, we live in that McQuick society, the drive-up mentality. And we think if, if I pray 
within 30 seconds if I don't get it. Uh, it must just not be God's will for me, right? But you know, we've got so many examples in the Word. Daniel sitting in a den of lions. <clears throat> Had to wait a little more than 30 seconds. 21 days. Yet, what did he do while he was in there? He sang and praised the Lord. Rejoiced in God's goodness. When they were throwing the three Hebrew children into the fire... They didn't go, oh, woe is me. I'm going to die in here. They started praising God. Then the fourth guy showed up in fire with them. We get wimpy about our prayers. We get wimpy about our faith. And we start wavering a little bit. When things don't go quite right. It says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It doesn't say in his prayer life. It says, in all his ways. It says, but let, the, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted with the rich that he is made low. Because of the flower of the grass, he passes away. And the sun is no sooner risen than a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flowers thereof fall, and the grace of the fashion of it perish it. So also the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Who doesn't think life goes by in a flash? Seems like yesterday, and we were just getting married and starting out. Next thing you know, got kid, mortgage, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And then the next thing you turn around and, okay, well, I'm starting this new career, we're doing this. And it just keeps changing. And you think, well, I need to plan for a lifetime and hope for tomorrow. Now you plan for a lifetime and you turn around that lifetime's already went by. You think, well, one day, I'll, oh no, I'm already at retirement. What happened? And you look at life and it goes by so fast. But just like what we read there, that's the way life is. But life eternal is something completely different. Life eternal is eternal. And that's what Christ has promised us if we will bear through all the temptations and make it to the end. That we will have eternal life with Him forever in perfection. How much better offer can you get? So why doesn't the world want that? Because we're not presenting that to them. We're telling them they are lost sinners and they are miserable people and they need to repent or else. Turn or burn. That's not what we need to tell them. We need to tell them the good things of God. God is offering you eternal life with Him in perfection. Without the flaws, without the testing, without the torment, there will be no enemy there to try to do things to you. No one's going to come up and slap you in the face. No one's going to shoot you. No one's going to do these things to you. Did everybody see the uh, college kids that got killed? I look at that and I, and I, I, I see bad things when I see it. And I think not one of them mentioned anything of faith. All they mentioned was they partied. And I think, did anybody reach them at all? The one family had five kids. I'm thinking, did anybody reach these folks? Did anybody tell them that there'd be these trials and tribulations, but Jesus has overcome for them? But they have to belong to Jesus to, to not have that. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, 
neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the sad part about it. Is we are enticed by the things inside of us. So if we have pride, we have arrogance within us, we have those flaws that really stick out, guess what we're going to be tested on? What's going to come against you? But Jesus said we should have a humble and contrite spirit. We should be at peace as much as possible with all men. But we know that man has that sinful nature in him. And without Christ, you can't turn that around. You cannot do it. People try. They try to be good. They try to do the right things. But there's not enough good to get you into heaven. There's not enough right things to get you into heaven. There's only one thing to get you in heaven. The name of Jesus Christ. And making Him Lord of your life. Because we are all drawn away from the lusts that's in our flesh. And the Word says that if a person says they have no sin, they are a liar. And I've had people tell me, I don't sin. <laughs> Let me step back because the lightning bolts are getting ready to hit you people. I did. I had, I had a pastor tell me that one time. I don't sin. Whoa, dude. You don't even know what you just said. You don't sin? I don't think so. You just lied. All have fallen short. Ain't none. None worthy. Not one. Zero. Why does anybody think they're so good? Haughty spirits. Haughty spirits. That's why we need humility in the church. We need that. But yet we still need a boldness to go out and tell people, Jesus died for you. He died that you don't have to suffer the consequences of sin. Do you know what those consequences are? Because you're going to be tempted and you're going to be enticed because it's in you. Because it does bring forth death. It says every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, who there is no variableness. It says lay apart all filthiness, superfility of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only. That's where most of the church fails. That's why Jesus said pray for workers because we need people to reach out to others and be doers of the word. At Bible study I'm teaching in the book of Acts right now. And to watch the Nazarene ladies and the Baptist ladies and the Catholic ladies and tell them, you know, you can do miracles. And they're going, I'm not a priest. What are you talking about? <laughs> and you start explaining to people what is available to them. They go, really? Really? Well, she taught Bible study for 50 years. She I mean she didn't teach you this stuff? No. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. And I see it now more today than ever that they do. And you go to a facility of all seniors 
And you start looking at that and you have got to shove faith out there. You've got to teach them about faith. But you've got to teach everybody about that faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you have to teach them about having faith in God. And you have to teach them about all these things. And you have to teach them about, you know what? If it comes out of your mouth, you ought to be sure of what you're saying about things. Don't take things for granted. People may not know it or believe it. I always thought people were more aware of what's in the Word. They're not. They're not. Most of the world is ignorant of what's in there. Even the churchgoers, most of them, they've never read this. We were talking the other the other week about, has anybody read it through completely? And I had a couple of them that said, well, yeah, I, I read it through completely. I said, more than once? Oh, oh, oh no, that's it's it's a that's a lot. I said, no, you should do it more than once a year. What? I go through it more than once a year, every year. You should be doing it also. Oh, that's an awful lot of reading. Yeah, it's a lot of reading. But he said, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. How can we rightly divide it if we don't even know what it is? We can't apply it. We don't have that wisdom. That's why he said, if any of you lack wisdom, just ask and he'll give it to you without measure. Because, you know, if I've got all the knowledge, but I can't get it across to you and I can't apply it, it's worthless. It's absolutely worthless. One year I had uh, interns from out at Holman and Rose Holman. And the one boy was from Germany. And he come in. I mean, this kid was so smart. It was scary. And I gave him a project and he looked at me and he says, that don't make any sense. I said, you, you need to understand why we do these things. I don't get it, he said. <laughs> and he started spouting off about all he knew and stuff. I said, therein lies your problem. You don't know it all yet, and you need to listen. <laughs> so I gave him some background and explained some things to him, and then he went back. When he come back, this kid was on top of it. But see, he thought he knew it. He thought he knew it all. And he thought the old guy didn't know nothing. But you know what? Old guys do know something. And people that have done a task or something for years and years should know. We should be able to lead people in the way of righteousness. We should be able to lead people to the cross. We should be able to tell people what's in this book. We should be able to explain things to them. Because people have questions. And they want to know why. And they want answers. And the only answer I have is what's in here. Because what I have isn't worth it. But what Jesus said is. So that's why we need to be more than just a hearer. Because he says it's like looking at a man beholding a natural face in a glass. And then all of a sudden, you forget who you were. He says, but whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Wait, well, you know, I think that's a promise there, isn't it? You'll be blessed in this. I was trying to explain to the folks out there about all the promises God has for them. And you tell them this and they go, really? Well, yeah, there's a couple thousand promises in here for you. How many of them do you have? Well, I ain't got that many. What happened? Where'd you miss it out on? 
What are you missing? Again, it's because if you won't search it, God will only take you as far as you'll let Him go with you. If you want to go into the deep things of God, He will take you there. The deeper you go, the stronger the trials get though too. The closer you draw to Him, the harder the test gets. So we have to be aware of what is going to come at us as we get closer and closer to Jesus. Because your flesh is going to shout and scream and go kicking as hard as it can against you. Because it doesn't want you to change. It wants you to eat of that fruit of the tree of good and evil and keep going back to it instead of the tree of life. So we need to look at that and make sure. It says, if any man, this is verse 26, it says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is vain. Have you ever met religious people? Yeah. I wonder how they ever even got saved. But then I look back in the Word and I see lots of religious people that were there when Jesus was there. And He'd go in and He'd teach in the temple. And He'd go in and sit down and tell all these biblical scholars and explain the Word to them. And they'd go, ain't this just the dumb kid that lives down the road? How, where do you get this at? He ain't been to no school, right? How does he know this stuff? Who is he? And then he'd do a miracle in front of their in front of their faces, showing signs and wonders. And they'd go, "Who does he think he is? He's not doing that on the right day." Really? I didn't know there was a wrong day for miracles. I thought every day was a good day for it. So those that are seem religious sometimes, guess what? They're part of the testing. And they're going to test your faith and see if you know what you're talking about. They're going to see if your faith will stand in the direct opposition of other people speaking against you. That's like if you stand on the street corner with a sign that says abortion is murder, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get arrested and you're going to get stuff thrown at you. You're going to get cussed and cursed. Right? What about if you walk around the Shriners building and pray? What will happen to you? Hey, you get phone calls. You get phone calls and people go, who, who, who are you people? What are you people doing? Uh, why do you need to know? I said, we was praying over your building. You're what? Praying over your building. Praying against you people. You bet. Poured it on the front door too. They didn't like that. Uh-uh. Not one iota. Why? It's not a God. It's not a God. And you've got to take a stand against it. It says to eschew evil, which means hunt it, hunt it down. We're not into passivity. Only peace. There is a difference. But he says to be you a doer of the work, not a hearer only. For anybody who hears of the word and is not a doer, he is like that man just looking in the mirror and can't remember what he's looking like. So we need to continue on. But we need to look into that perfect law of liberty and continue and not be a forgetful hearer like it says, but a doer of the work and then we can be blessed. We can receive one of those great blessings that God has in store for us. But pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And you know, that's getting to be pretty hard anymore, isn't it? To be unspotted from the world. You remember growing up and you did something wrong? Mm -hmm. 
and your mom come over and you hung your head and you cried and you thought mom was being so mean to you. Yes, as I pulled the plants out and looked at the roots and did it several times in a row, I remember those things. But isn't it that way when we do anything wrong? Our Father is looking over us going, now you shouldn't do that. You know better than doing this stuff. Come on now. You need to repent of this and come back. Stop that. He's doing it just like your mom did. She didn't come up and knock you upside the head, knock you down, kick you while you're down, and give you one of them body slams, you know. She didn't do that to you. Ah, you may have got spanked. But she didn't go out and beat you and crucify you and take you out and stone you. She didn't do any of those bad things. She tried to correct us. And you think about all the things that God is trying to do to us. Through every trial and every every temptation that we face, He's standing there telling us, He's telling us every time. Oh, you're doing great. Come on. Come on. You can do this. You can beat this. He's your cheerleader. He really is. He's your cheerleader. He's cheering you on to make it through the trial and make it through the temptations. And He's cheering you on. And if you fail, He's going, Now you shouldn't do that. You know better. You know we love you. We know you care, that we care about you. You know that. You don't want to do this thing. It just hurts you. You need to repent and turn. Come on. Come on. Come on back. But we struggle with those kind of things. Why is that? Why is it we struggle with that? Because... Who likes to be told they're wrong? Honestly. I don't like it any better than anybody else. But you know what? There's times I need to be told if I'm wrong. My wife will tell me. (laughs) And it's okay. Because you know what? Every one of us are imperfect. And that's why we're... Even though we have faults and we show our faults to one another, it says... We should just act like it's not that much and go on. In James chapter 2, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For there comes one into your assembly, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also the poor man in vile raiment, right? And you have respect to him that wears the gay clothing, And say, sit here in a good place. And the poor guy, you say, hey, sit underneath my feet. You know, he's he's talking about how we handle life through every trial and tribulation. And every temptation of our life is treated the same way. So we need to change the way we think about it and the way we kind of want to do things. In chapter 2, 14, it says, What does it profit, my brother, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is destitute of daily food, and and you say unto them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So they go hand in hand, don't they? But if I don't have the faith to stand up and come against the trials and tribulations and temptations... What's that say I've got? That means I have doubt and unbelief. 
So I don't want that either. So we do need to lay apart all the filthiness that goes on around us. We do need to separate ourselves out from the world. But everybody's not going to be required to wear holy underwear. Okay? You're not going to have to wear, dress up in black clothes and go door to door. All right? Not going to require that of you to do that. But what are you required to do? What is Jesus calling each and every one of us to do? He's given every one of us a job and a task. And that's not just here at the church. It's a task in life. He has prepared you for that task your whole bringing up. So we need to know what that is and we need to make sure that that's the works that we are doing. Because people will tell you, well, I'm a good person. I ain't met one yet. The devil believes, and he ain't going to make it. So, what about you and me? We all like to think we're part of that Perfect family. Picture perfect, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, this is what most of the family looks like. Yep. Poor, wretched, naked. Deplorables. But you know, we do. We want the image of that perfect family. We really do. We really want to look like that. One too many clicks. We really want to look like that perfect family, but we know that don't exist. That's not it. And this is more like what we have. You look at your outlaws and your in-laws and everything else, and you think, whoa, how did I get in this mess? Yeah, that's pretty bad, ain't it? That tells me there's some problems in the body. It says, Thou believest that there's one God, thou does well. The devils also believe, but they tremble. Well, thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scriptures were fulfilled. Abraham believed it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Isn't that what you want to be called? The friend of God? I think that's what we're all striving for, is to have that kind of relationship with the Lord that he calls his friend. And that's what he says. He says he's we're no longer just anything else that we're brothers and he's we're his friends now once we were his enemies alienated against him but now we have been brought into because he died on the cross we have been brought into his family by his blood which means we ought to change and we ought to be looking a little different in this then we should have a better outlook on our lives than that Now he tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation, right? But look at the quote at the top, the second line, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Every one of us feels this. We need to work on that. We need to strengthen that up in our lives. We need to pray one for another that these things leave us and that we can become closer to the Lord because that's the biggest thing that hurts the church is we let our flesh dominate us most of the time. We've let our flesh rule us. Our minds go wild with the things that could, might, or who knows. 
Somebody says, well, you know, we're going to have another pandemic. The flu's coming. COVID's coming again. There's going to be another one besides. Boy, everybody needs to run out and be fearful and get lots of shots. No, you don't. No, you need to tell your flesh to shut up. Don't let panic come in and fear come into your life and dominate you. Do you need to eat healthy and do the right things? Yes, you do. Should you get flu shots and other things? To a point. If it's got a good track record, flu shots do have a half half decent track record. The COVID has not had a good track record. Now they have the they're trying to push Omicron variant shots out on people and they're requiring college students to take them or they can't get in. Yet they have no history on it and they know there's side effects to it, especially at that age. So you wonder, what's driving people? Fear, panic. Fear's the first thing in the garden and it's the first thing that comes after you. And it's part of the works of the flesh. And that's why we need to deal with that. It's the biggest thing that we truly need to deal with is to try to deal with that. Because if we can, there's no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. But we can't walk after that flesh. We've got to do something with it. Isaiah 55 there says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Let the wicked forsake His ways. Right? Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to sit down to listen to the news and you'd actually get told the truth? Wouldn't that be a great thing? But I got bad news for you, that ain't gonna happen. And it's just like the midterm elections. Don't expect great things, please. You'll be disappointed. Why? Because they're not willing to forsake their wicked ways. When you have people stand in front of you and boldly lie to you. That's wickedness. And unless they repent and turn from their wicked ways, they're going to go through tribulation. We know Jesus is coming back shortly. The signs are here for it. So we need to be prepared for it. We need to know what the hour of the day is. And we need to get our hearts right with the Lord no matter what. Amen? Amen. Like I said, there's, there's testing coming. You know what? In school, I didn't do very good at testing. Probably because I didn't study. I remember when they said to clean your locker out, I said, why would I do that? I only put my books in there. I never went back to it. (laughs) They go, oh, okay. Well, we'll check on that for you. I thought, you know what? I look back and go, man, if I'd actually applied myself, what would have been the possibilities? What was God's real plan for me? (laughs) Right? But you see, His plan evolves according to what your obedience is. If you're obedient, then it'll line up more with what His plan is. Then, if it's not, He has to move heaven and earth to get you closer to His plan or modify the plan so that the best things can happen in your life. Some of the best things may not be things that we might think of. Amen. 
because some of those might be some tragic events that took place, but they made a profound change in your life and in your walk. One of the greatest ones I ever went through was, of course, when we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What a change it makes to walk with the Holy Ghost instead of kicking Him all the way down the aisle. But look back at the past and see just what has God done to get you to this point. And what's the task ahead of you that He wants you to do? Because it's not over yet, folks. And until Jesus comes back or your last breath, you take it and we bury you. It ain't over. There is no retirement in the kingdom. It goes until you start the next life. And that's what Jesus promised you. That you would go from this one and step right into eternity. But at that point, everything changes for you. You get a new body. You get a new outlook on life. Because life is suddenly going to be great. And all the other stuff is going to pass away. And you're going to see His glory and you're going to go, I wish I'd have been here sooner. This is so good. And you won't have to ask, when's the fun going to start? It will have already started. Because when you walk in the gate, the shouting and screaming is going to come on. And they're going to go, I ain't believed I animated in. Wow! I never thought they'd have let her in here. But they're going to say that about all of us. They're going to look and go, I never dreamed you'd have made it. And you're going to look around and you're going to see people and you're going to go, I really never thought you'd make it. Oh my gosh, how'd you make it in here? Well, I repented on my deathbed. <laughs> hey, you made it. Yeah, that's right. And those that have gone before us are going, I wish they'd hurry up and get here. I'm tired of waiting already. And I got eternity ahead of me. Luckily, they're praying for us. Amen. Amen.